time for another edition of the Collector's Corner. Aloha, and welcome to another edition of the Collector's Corner, brought to you by our friends at the Sadistic Penguin Studio. I am your host, the man of notorious and questionable character, Aloha Mr. Hand, and today I wanted to uh, go through some World Series stuff. That's right. It is October. October means it's the World Series. World Series Baseball. Something that I fortunately got to experience in 2005. Sadly, I probably won't see it again based on the way this franchise is going. But that is neither here nor there. I will say that I have been lucky and Cub fans have been lucky because we've actually seen our teams actually play and win in a World Series. So we can't take too much bad, but... They could do so much more, both of them, in all honesty. I'm not fan shaming one or the other, both of them. So, anyway, let's move on from there. Now, I am recording this on Monday, October 21st. This is being released in conjunction with Game One on Friday night, uh, 20 October 25th. And so, I want to start with. A ticket stub from a game that took place 39 years ago today. Voted the greatest game of all time. That's right. Game 6 of the 1975 World Series. Let me see. There we go. Get, get that over there. Get the glare out of the way. Autographed by Carlton Fisk. You can see it's an authentic ticket right up here. Authentic. And then... PSA DNA cert means it's an authentic autograph from Carlton Fisk on this ticket. For anyone who doesn't know what this game is, it's very simple. This is the game where Carlton Fisk hit the 12th inning home run that was legendarily caught on TV where he was waving his arms. It bounced off the foul pole. And the story goes that the reason they got the shot of him waving the ball fair is because there was a rat in the on the camera that was recording it and the cameraman was terrified to move the camera and because of that they got you know a historic moment in baseball history i mean you can't beat that at all it's incredible uh what they got but also you know not only does the 75 world series game six of the 75 world series go down as as the greatest world series game of all time the World Series itself is one of the greatest of all time. And I do have a couple other... Uh, I do have most tickets from that series. I am missing game one. I do have the remainder. I have games two through seven. Um, and so what I'll show you is game five. Uh, significant game because Tony Perez, a Hall of Famer himself, uh, had a two-homer game in this game. And you can see I got the ticket... Autograph there, two home run game, big red machine inscription on it as well from Mr. Perez. Uh, some of these I haven't gotten to PSA yet, others I have. My intention is in November when the Sports Collector Show is in town, uh, the weekend before Thanksgiving, I plan on hitting up the PSA booth and getting a lot, submitting a lot of these for authentication. And this ticket I know I showed uh, recently. Uh, because of other events, but this is, you have to remember, this is the Pete Rose autograph from Game 7. Game 7 is a very underrated game. If you ever get a chance, it's on YouTube. I think every game from this series is on YouTube, to be honest with you. Go and check it out. It's an incredible game. Joe Morgan hits, a, as, the, as it's described, a looper in the ninth inning to give the uh, Reds the lead that they would eventually win but Pete Rhodes was the MVP and you can see I got him to also inscribe Big Red Machine on there as well R.I.P. Pete you can go into a lot of conversation about Pete Rose and his place and should he or shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame it's for another time I did that already you can go check it out in a previous episode so now I want to move on to some other things with uh, other uh, significant events in the World Series the next ticket I'm going to show was voted the number two game of all time. It is, let me put it over here, 
Game 7 of the 1991 World Series. This is the legendary John Smoltz, Jack Morris showdown that went scoreless into the 10th inning and the Twins won the game on a fly ball in the bottom of the 10th inning. They won one to nothing. Jack Morris pitched the entire game. The entire game. Now, this game is legendary because of the showdown because not only was Smoltz a Tigers a Tigers, uh, he was drafted by the Tigers and he was a Tigers prospect who was traded to the Braves in 1987 for Doyle Alexander who helped the Tigers make it to the 87 uh, American League Championship Series in which they lost to, wait for it, the Minnesota Twins. Another fun fact about the Twins in the World Series. The Twins have never lost a home, <clears throat> a home World Series game. Or those... Let me rephrase that. The Twins have never lo never lost a home World Series game in the Hubert Horatio Humphrey Metrodome, or as Mike Ditka liked to call it, the Roller Dome. They never lost a home game there. In 1987 and 1991, the Twins went to the World Series both times. Both series went seven games. The Twins were fortunate to have home field advantage, and they won each series four to three, winning all their home games. And losing all their road games. It's just weird, weird, wild stuff. So now moving on to uh, another game. And I know I showed this one last week because it took place on October 15th, 1988. And that is the, the Kirk Gibson, Dennis Eckersley Game 1 of the 1988 World Series with Kirk Gibson hitting the legendary walk-off homer. I described this in the episode I did about October 15, 1988, so I don't want to go into any more detail. I just figured I would show this again so everyone can see it, uh, and we can go from there. Now, another historic World Series game is for... The next two are for different reasons whatsoever, you know, altogether. The first one is, I'm going to quote some commentary from Vin Scully, who was the announcer. Behind the bag, it gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. That's right. Game 6 of the 1986 World Series. The Red Sox were one out away, winning by two runs in the bottom of the 10th inning. One out away, they were winning by two, and they lost the game. It is one of the most amazing meltdowns ever. I remember watching it. Just sitting there in stunned silence going, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And the Mets pull it out. A little history on it. So that was a Saturday night in October of 1986 when the Mets won Game 6. Game 7 was supposed to be on Sunday night, but it was rained out. So Monday night, the Giants were playing on Monday night football, and the Mets were playing in Game 7 at Shea Stadium. The commentators for Monday Night Football said there were a couple points where they could hear the cheers at the Meadowlands at the time coming from Shea Stadium during the during Game 7 of the World Series. And let me just say this. I know it's, a, it's the Dodgers and Yankees in the World Series this weekend. Yankee Stadium sucks. The new Yankee Stadium sucks. City Field absolutely blows it away. If you need to go to one ballpark in New York, forget Yankee Stadium. Go to City Field. You'll thank me later. Now, the next one I'm going to show is historic for an entirely different reason. This is a ticket from Game 3 of the 1989 World Series. Yes, this is a ticket from the Earthquake game. Approximately 5.06 p.m. San Francisco time, the Earth doth quaketh. And the game was canceled for approximately a week and a half while San Francisco tried to recover from the devastation that occurred during that world or during that earthquake. The world there was questions on whether or not the World Series would would even resume that year. It did. The A's were already up to nothing. They had won the first two games in Oakland. They played games three and four Friday and Saturday of the following week, and the A's swept the Giants. In the World Series. But it wasn't much of a celebration or anything else. Because I think it was just like. 
They were so... Remember, all those players lived there because it was the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's. They were all living there. So they were impacted by this. Uh, and it definitely affected the, the, the tone, the tenor, and everything else of that World Series. So there wasn't really a celebration, so to speak. Not like you see where everyone's just going ape shit and everything else. But there really wasn't a celebration. It was more of a, okay, that's great, we won, let's go work on stuff after this happens. So um, now next is I want to show a couple of others that feature uh, key players uh, in my collection. So the first one is a ticket stub of a Dodgers-Yankees game. The score was Dodgers 5, Yankees 2. It took place on October 2nd, 1963. Now, this game is legendary because Sandy it was Sandy Koufax versus Whitey Ford. This is the matchup everyone wanted in the World Series. Yes, I wasn't alive then, but still, I know. Everybody wanted this matchup. Koufax, Whitey Ford. Two of the premier left-handers of the day. Sandy Koufax struck out 15 Yankees. Now remember, the Yankees were the two-time defending World Series champions at that point, going into 63. They lost in 60 to the Pirates on the Bill Mazarowski home run. They beat the Reds in 61, and they beat the now San Francisco Giants in 62, and then you have the now Los Angeles Dodgers coming in in 1963. This was the first time the Dodgers and Yankees faced each other after the Dodgers moved from Brooklyn to New York. There were several instances where the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Yankees played in the World Series. I want to say it was 41, 47, 49, 52, 53, 55, 56. The Yankees won all of them except 1955. So this was the Dodgers' second World Series win against the New York Yankees. Koufax, of course, said, you know, setting at the time, setting the record with 15 Ks. It has since been broken by Bob Gibson, is one. So it has since been broken, but he set the record at the time with 15 Ks. Now, there is legendary World Series players, and then there is a guy who has a name to match the month. That's right. Reggie Jackson's known as Mr. October. Now Reggie has played in he has played in six World Series. Well, technically his teams were in six World Series. He only played in five of them because he got injured in 1972 in game five of the ALCS. I think he ruptured his hamstring or something like that and was unable to play in the 1972 World Series. He came back the next year on a mission. He won the AL MVP that in 1973. He won the AL MVP and he also won the 1973 World Series MVP. As you can see here, this is the ticket from Game 7 of the 1973 World Series. He was, it's labeled Mr. October 1973 World Series, um, 1973 AL MVP and 1973 World Series MVP. Reggie Jackson was the MVP of this series. This is also the game that Reggie hit his first World Series home run in. This game, Game 7. There's a lot of that game that's on YouTube. Not the full game. They have some issues, but you could watch the highlights of the home run he hits and everything else in that game. The interesting thing about that series, if you ever get the chance... There are two documentaries I highly suggest you watch about the 1970s Oakland A's. One is this called The Swingin' A's, and it was done by MLB Network. And there's another one that was done by Comcast Bay Area about the Oakland A's, and the 1970s Oakland A's in particular. That is a fascinating watch. I strongly suggest if you have the time and want to, watch both of them. This team will amaze you. Not only at how good it was, they won three World Series in a row, for God's sake, 72, 73, 74, and they beat, in 72, they beat the Big Red Machine in seven games. 
73, they beat the Mets in seven games. 74, they beat the Dodgers in only... It only took them five games to beat the Dodgers. But you have to watch the documentaries to understand why they beat the Dodgers in five games. The Dodgers did something that, frankly, pissed them off. They won in five games. But anyway, so moving on. Now, I, as I said, he has a month named after him. This is game six of the 1977 World Series. Oh, yeah. Dodgers and Yankees. This is the night Reggie Jackson became Mr. October by hitting three, not one, not two, but three home runs on three consecutive swings and three consecutive at-bats. He, he took a walk his first at-bat, but after that, home run, home run, home run, with each home run being longer than the last one. With the last one off of Charlie Huff, former Sox pitcher too, that went to dead center. Majestic shot. And you could hear Howard Cosell just, oh my, just like having a conniption in the booth about, forget who the MVP is, we know who the MVP is and everything else. Tom Seaver also on the call for that game as well. But it's a fascinating, fascinating thing to see. It really is. Now... Obviously, people who know me know that my favorite player of all time is Johnny Bench. Uh, and so I have to show off some Johnny Bench stuff. This is a ticket stub from the 1970 World Series Game 1, which took place in Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. Johnny, This is Johnny Bench's first World Series game, as he has there. It's also Pete Rose's first World Series game. But the 1970 World Series will always go down as the Brooks Robinson series because that's where Brooks Robinson became known as the human vacuum cleaner. He gobbled up everything hit to him. You ever get a chance to watch the highlight film of it? Watch it because you see some of the plays and you're like, oh my God, how did he do that? There's a play in particular in game one that you will mark and just go, holy crap, how did he do that? But anyway... Now, I mentioned the A's earlier and the 1972 World Series. It was the first World Series out of three in a row that they won. They were heavy underdogs against the Big Red Machine. And obviously going in without Reggie Jackson, it made them even bigger underdogs. Even with Reggie, they would have been underdogs. They were bigger underdogs without Reggie. But this is a ticket stub from Game 7 of the 1972 World Series, autographed by Raleigh Fingers. Because he was the pitcher on the mound when the final out was recorded. It was Pete Rose to... Uh, Raleigh Fingers pitched to Pete Rose, who hit a ball to Joe Rudy in left field. And by the way, don't sleep on Joe Rudy, an incredibly underrated left fielder. Uh, who made the catch, and the A's were World Series champions. Now, there's also another significant event that happened in the 1972 World Series. That... People know about but don't connect the dots, if you will. This is a ticket stub from Game 2 of the 1972 World Series. Now, Joe Rudy had the game of his life. He hits a home run and he makes an incredible play off the wall in Riverfront Stadium uh, to snare a ball and damn near start a double play. If you ever get the chance, go on YouTube. Game 2 is uh, intact on YouTube. The entire game is on there. You can go and watch the entire game. But focus on the ninth inning defense by the Oakland A's in that game. You'll be amazed. It's something I wish the White Sox could aspire to, to be honest with you. But this is also a ticket stub from the last public appearance of Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson had... Uh, That's when he gave his famous speech about wanting to see a black face in the dugout meaning a manager in the dugout. Unfortunately, Jackie Robinson passed away roughly 10 days later, I think it was. So this this ticket holds a significant piece of history since it's also Jackie Robinson's last public appearance. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't show a couple of these. This is White Sox ticket 2005 World Series Game 2 signed by Paul Canerco. Who hit the Grand Slam. Uh, need to go find a signing with Pesednik. He signed this summer. I was out of town. And they did not allow drop-off. 
So I'm hoping that he comes back around next summer so I can get this signed and complete this bad boy. I also have, make sure, game three with Jeff Blum. As you can see there, uh, he signed this for me. I also had him sign my 2005 World Series base. And he asked me if it was from game three. It wasn't. He was willing to make me an offer for it. But it wasn't from game three, and it wouldn't have been right for me to say yes and take the money because it, it wasn't. And then this is from the greatest night in Chicago sports history. Fuck you, Cub fans. The greatest sporting event did happen on a Wednesday night, but it wasn't in Cleveland. It was in Houston. Game four, signed by Freddie Garcia and dated October 26, 2005. Freddie pitched the game of his life in that one, and the White Sox won one to nothing with Juan Uribe making a play in down the third base line. That if Derek Jeter makes that play, the media would still be talking about. But since it wasn't Derek Jeter, oh, we don't need to talk about it. It was better than that bullshit play Jeter going into the stands that they always brag about. That was a regular season game. This guy did it in the ninth inning of a clinching game of a World Series. Shut up. And I forgot to show this earlier, but I need to show this anyway. This is from Game 4 of the 1976 World Series. Yes, it's Johnny Bench again. Deal with it, people. It is. He is the World Series MVP of 1976. This is a ticket from Game 4 where he hits two home runs and the Reds complete the sweep of the Yankees in Yankee Stadium. Uh, he batted like 5... What was it? 8 for 15, I believe. Like 533, somewhere around there. And, you know, he just carried the team. He had a terrible season, but he carried the team in October. This is it. This is his uh, two-homer game, World Series MVP game, that I also had signed. Now, I have other tickets I could show, too, but I'm clocking in at 21 minutes. So, I think I'm going to put a lid on this. If you have any other questions, want to see stuff, want to ask me anything... You know where to find me. And with that, I am out of here. Later.